Pitanya na Asmai Shri Gurave Namaha Pancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhajivacha Patita Nam Pavanityo Vaishnavibyo Na Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavanda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, so we're on Mantra 17, okay. and we're, we're about ha more than halfway through the purport, right? So beginning at the section where it says, uh, the Lord clearly describes his in his intimate relationship with his devotee in the Bhagavad Gita. Right. So we were we were hearing those verses from the Bhagavad Gita nine thirty to thirty-four, where the Lord Krishna describes how he accepts everyone, even we're of low birth, but if we're situated in devotional service, then we're considered righteous and we can attain the supreme destination. So, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains the verses. And a little differently, we said, one should regard a devotee of Krishna to be on the right path of the saints, even though such a devotee may seem to be suduracar, a person of loose conduct or character. One should try to understand the real purport of this word, suduracha. A conditioned soul has to act for double, has to act not for, a conditioned soul has to act for double functions, namely for the maintenance of the body, and attain for self-realization. Social status, mental development, cleanliness, austerity, nourishment, and the struggle for existence are all for the, con for the maintenance of the body. The self realized the self realization part of one's activities is executed in one's occupation as a devotee of the Lord. And one performs actions in that connection also. One must perform these two different functions along parallel lines because a conditioned soul cannot give up the maintenance of the body. The proportion of activities for maintenance of one of the body 
decreases, however, in proportion to the increase in devotional service. As as long as the pro, as long as the proportion as long as the proportion of devotional service does not come to the right point, there is a chance for an occasional exhibition of worldliness. But it should be noted that such worldliness cannot continue for long because by the grace of the Lord, such imperfections will come to an end very shortly. Therefore, the path of devotional service is the only right path. If, if one is on the right path, even as occasional occurrences of worldliness does not hamper in the advancement of self-realization. So this is a special relationship, which the special kindness which Lord Krishna shows upon the devotee that the uh, the tendency towards worldliness will gradually disappear in course of time. Srila Prabhupada explains in his purport on this section in the Bhagavad Gita that, that Krishna can forgive you once and he may forgive you twice, but you can't go on and take advantage. I think that every day we can do something. Every day we can go uh, and, and show some worldliness. The, the occurrence of this uh, loose character, this, this kind of quality, this uh, will certainly disturb the mass of devotees. And the devotee should feel very guilty if he is actually doing something which is not appropriate for the character of a devotee. He should feel very bad about it, and he should make a point to try to give up this worldliness. So this is the idea that don't think this is a license for us to continue to do all kinds of nonsense activities. But one can do something, one may do something, but we should lament, we should grit. We should lament ourselves. We should feel very bad, very guilty about it. And we should make endeavors to stop that tendency towards this, uh, towards the bad habits. So Prabhupada's explaining conditioned souls. You know, we're conditioned souls. We're attached to the body. We maintain the body. We're not fully liberated. We're not just simply devoted to self-realization. And we don't have some interest in the material world. We have jobs. We have families and so on. We have to maintain these things. So uh, that's all right. But it's not, it doesn't doesn't give us a license for unrestricted sense gratification. There has to be some control. And, and Krishna is a purifying agent. If one is actually in Krishna consciousness, then Krishna will enlighten us from the heart and he will allow, he will not allow us to uh, continue in sinful ways. Or not not so much sinful, but loose loose character. All right. Prabhupada continues. The facilities of devotional service are denied. 
the facilities of devotional service are denied the impersonalists because they are attached to the Brahma Jyoti feature of the Lord. As suggested in the previous mantra, they cannot penetrate the Brahma Jyoti because they do not believe in the personality of Godhead. Their business is mostly word jugglery and mental speculation. Consequently, the impersonalists pursue a fruitless labor as confirmed in the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. And Prabhupada refers to 12th chapter, 5th verse, where Lord Krishna describes the, those who are on the path of the impersonal absolute, then they will make advancement very slowly and with great difficulty. So the impersonalists, they have these problems, right? All the facilities, Prabhupada's purport, all the facilities suggested in this mantra can be easily obtained by constant contact with the personal feature of the absolute truth. Devotional service to the Lord consists essentially of nine transcendental activities. And so then Prabhupada lists the nine kinds of activities. And then he talks about uh, he said, the nine principles, the nine principles of devotional service taken all together or one by one, help a devotee remain constantly in touch with God. In this way, at the end of life, it is easy for the devotee to remember the Lord. By adopting, by adopting only one of the nine principles, the following Renowned, per, renowned devotees of the Lord were able to achieve the highest perfection. And when Prabhupada lists each of the nine processes, and he gives the example of a person who achieved perfection. So this is something which we would all want to know. You need to remember this kind of information. This is often uh, required or quoted. First of all, by hearing Maharaj Pariksit uh, attained perfection in his life. And then just by glorifying the Lord Sukadeva Goswami and speaking the Srimad Bhagavatam, he got perfection. And then by praying to the Lord, Akrura attained the desired result. Then Prahlad Maharaj is the example who, of a person who attained perfection by remembering. Right? Prahlad Maharaj would often say, I don't do any service. I only remember the Lord. He said, the devotees who do service, they're greater than me. And anyway, Prahlad Maharaj achieved perfection simply by remembering. Then by worshipping, the example is Prithu Maharaj attained perfection. And by serving the lotus feet of the Lord, the goddess of fortune Lakshmi attained perfection. By rendering personal service to the Lord, Hanuman attained, per attained perfection. And through his friendship with the Lord, Arjuna, attained the desired result. 
And then by surrendering everything to the Lord, Bali Maharaj attained the desired result. So these are the examples usually given. There are other people also, just like uh, Rukmini is often given as an example of one who surrendered everything to Lord Krishna. And the Lord has other friends beside Arjuna, Akrura, uh, Ud Uddhava is also the friend of Lord Krishna. Anyway, these are the usual examples which are given. Mm. Actually, the explanation of this mantra and of practically all the mantras of the Vedic hymns is summarized in the Vedanta Sutra and properly explained in Srimad Bhagavatam. In Srimad Bhagavatam, Srimad Bhagavatam is the mature fruit of the Vedic tree of wisdom. In Srimad Bhagavatam, this particular mantra is explained in the questions and answers between Maharaj Parikshit and Sukadev Goswami at the very beginning of their meeting. Hearing and chanting of the signs of God is the basic principle of devotional life. The complete Bhagavatam was heard by Maharaj Parikshit and chanted by Sukadeva Goswami. Maharaj Parikshit inquired from Shukadev because Sukadev was a greater spiritual master than any great yogi or transcendentalist of his time. Sukadeva Goswami was the son of Srila Vyasa Dev and we know he was fixed on the impersonal Brahman, but when he heard Srimad Bhagavatam, then he was attracted. So Sukadeva Goswami is an example of someone who was impersonalist but became devotee. <laughs> and he, he had the opportunity to hear Srimad Bhagavatam from his own father. So Maharaj Pariksit's main question was, what is the duty of every man, specifically at the time of death? Sukadev Goswami answered, Tasmat Bharata Sarvatma Bhagavan Ishwaro Hari. Shrotavya Kirtitavya Shya Smartavyas Smartavyas it's it's a tabayam. Everyone who desires to be free from all anxieties should always hear about, glorify, and remember the personality of Godhead, who is the supreme director of everything the extinguisher of all difficulties and the super soul of all living entities. The verse is quoted from the second canto, first chapter, text number five. So Dev Goswami had just appeared. And 
Maharaj Parikshit was putting questions to him, and this was his main question. This was what Maharaj Parikshit wanted to know. He wanted to hear from Sukadeva Goswami. And he felt attached to Sukadeva Goswami because he knew he was the son of Vyasadev. And Maharaj Parikshit was also coming in the line of the Pandavas. He was the grandson of Arjuna. And Arjuna was the great devotee of Lord and friend of Lord Krishna. <laughs> so he was happy to hear from Sukadeva Goswami. Prabhupada continues, so-called human society is generally engaged at night in sleeping and having sex and during the daytime in earning as much money as possible or else in shopping for family maintenance. People have very little time to talk about the personality of Godhead or to inquire about him. They have dismissed God's existence in so many ways, primarily by declaring him to be impersonal. That is without sense perception. But in the Vedic literature, whether the Upanishads, Vedanta Sutra, Bhagavad Gita, or Srimad Bhagavatam, it is declared that the Lord is a sentient being and is, su and is supreme over all other living entities. His glorious activities are identical with himself. One should therefore not indulge in hearing and speaking of the rubbish activities of worldly politicians and so-called big men in society, but should mold his life in such a way that he can engage in godly activities without wasting a second. Sri Ishopanisha directs us towards such godly activities. So Srila Prabhupada is encouraging all of us. You, we may say, well, I'm not about to die, but Maharaj Parikshit asked the question, he said, what is the duty of one who is about to die? And what is the duty of all men at all time? And so the answer was given. It's the same for everyone, that we should hear, chant, and remember the, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is the safest thing to do in our time here in this material world. We don't know what is the future, how long we have left, but we want to use the time carefully and try to use it all for the service of Lord Krishna. That, that will be success. And the final paragraph, unless one is accustomed to devotional practice, what will what will he remember at the time of death when the body is dislocated and how can he be and how can he pray to the almighty lord to remember his sacrifices sacrifice means denying the interest of the senses. One has to learn this. One has to learn this art by, exp by employing the senses in the service of the Lord during one's lifetime.
one can utilize the results of such practice at the time of death. Well, it's a sobering thought for all of us to consider. We want to make sure we make use of our time here in this material body. We should be conscious of what we do. And we should endeavor to act for the pleasure of the Lord. So that So using our time in this human life, we want to practice remembering the Lord. And how to remember the Lord? Well, any of the nine kinds of devotional service. Of course, some are easier to perform than others. For example, becoming the friend of Lord Krishna and surrendering everything that those two kinds of devotional service are only meant for people who are, who are at the stage of Raganuga Bhakti, who have come to the level of spontaneous devotion. Without being at the level, without having this Rati Baba, then we won't be able to be a friend of the Lord or to surrender everything. And then Prabhupada said, we won't be able to, if we're not in the habit of praying to the Lord, then at the time of death also, we won't pray to the Lord. So we do want to get into the habit of praying to the Lord and offering our prayers and we can repeat the prayers just like here in Ishopanishad. We're given some prayers. The devotees praying to the Lord, please remember all my sacrifices. Please remember all that I've done for you. And kindly remove your dazzling effulgence. Let me see your form of bliss. Like this, the devotees offering prayers. But not everybody will pray. Just like in Srimad Bhagavatam, it tells about the child in the womb. And the child in the womb is offering prayers to the Lord, is praying to the Lord, let me out. I'm suffering so much in here. Please just free me from this condition. But not everyone, not every child in the womb prays to the Lord. If it's, if the, child in the womb doesn't have the habit of offering prayers, then he won't be praying. So th that's explained by Jiva Goswami and Srimad Bhagavatam. That not everyone has a habit to pray. Even the child in the womb doesn't pray. Not every child. Some special ch children may pray. All right. Are there any questions on this mantra 17? Anyone? Uh, Guru Maharaj, uh, for worshipping, uh, there is an example of Prithu Maharaj. I want to know, because many people worship the Lord, uh, what's uh, special about Prithu Maharaj uh, in worshipping the Lord? Well, it's described the activities of Prithu Maharaj in the fourth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. How he appeared and he uh, restored the conditions on the earth planet. Because before Prithu Maharaj, there had been a demon, a demon king. So Vena, Vena had been there and he, he had stopped all sacrifices and, and so that when Venu Maharaj came and stopped all sacrifices so then the earth did not yield anymore didn't yield anymore the, there were no grains there was no crops growing because Mother Earth was not getting any sacrifice 
So Prithu Maharaj came and he worshipped the Lord and he was able to restore the situation. We properly worshipped the Lord and uh, by his sacrifice, even the four Kumaras came and they offered their appreciation to Maharaj Prithu. So Maharaj Prithu, he was a, he did great service on behalf on behalf of the Lord. So what what he did was the, these sacrifices. He performed these yagyas. And, the, and of course, in the time of Prithu Maharaj, it was not Kali Yuga. It was uh, Treta Yuga. And Prithu Maharaj performed the yagyas and was able to attract the demigods to come. So he's considered the Acharya, somebody who got perfection by worshipping. Uh -huh. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, In Kali Yuga, we can't do this kind of sacrifices, right? We have to do the Sangeet Kanekya. Yeah, there's okay. only one sacrifice in the Kali Yuga. Kali Yuga Dharma Harinam Sankirtan. Right? That is the real yeah. sacrifice in the Kali Yuga. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Okay, any other question? Okay, Hare then Krishna. We'll... yes, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. I have yeah. a question from the, the previous class. Uh, so, you know. Uh, it is believed that we have relationships with our spiritual master from door to door. Uh, and uh, uh, but we uh, came in Krishna consciousness uh, only in uh, this uh, life. And uh, what kind of relationships uh, could we have with our spiritual teacher in the previous life in that case? What kind of relationship we have this spiritual teacher in our previous life? Yes, Gurudev. Well, why do you have to have had a relationship with him in your previous life? Uh, is it because it is believed that we have relationships from birth to birth with our spiritual teacher? Is that true? I've never heard before. I don't know where you get this from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's not true. Yes, no, not uh, in uh, for every person. Yeah, I've, for I've, ne I've never heard before. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead. Mantra 18. Agner nae supatai rai asman Vishwani deva vayun bani vidvan Yayodhyasma jahuranam eno Vyostam tenam uptim videma All right, translation. Oh my Lord, as powerful as fire, O Omnipotent One, now I offer you all obeisances, falling on the ground at your feet. O my Lord, please lead me on the right path to reach you. And since you know all that I have done in the past, please free me from the reactions to my past sins, so that there will be no hindrance to my progress. So you can see the, the prayer of the devotees like this. This prayer is said, Swain Bhuvamanu, I think, was a person who spoke this, Vishopanishad. 
And it means praying like this to the Lord. That you know everything. You know all the nonsense I did in my past. So please free me from the reactions. And I help. I want to progress. And of course, the devotee begins, he offers glorification of the Lord. O oh, my Lord, powerful as the fire, O oh, omnipotent one, now I offer you all obeisances, falling on the ground at your feet. This is how we should approach the Lord. Sometimes people tell me, oh, that Krishna came to see them. I ask them, did you offer obeisances? Did you offer prayers? Did you say anything? Oh, no, I didn't say anything. No. So you didn't, you didn't say anything? You didn't do anything? So <laughs> what kind of right do you have to see the Lord? The Lord is only visible to those who... The Lord is only visible to those who are his devotees. Mm -hmm. All right. So we'll read Prabhupada's purport. By surrendering to the Lord and praying for his causeless mercy, the devotee can progress on the path of complete self-realization. Now, I think when Anna is coming down like that, I'll keep the day. Oh. No, because next week there's days where I work, so I can't take. Okay, can, can we mute everyone? Please mute, please mute. Uh, yes, yes, the, the Mataji who is doing the co-host need to switch off the mar the microphone. Some noise is coming. Yes, Mara, we can hear properly. Okay. Well, all right. So by surrendering, we have to pray for the causeless mercy of the Lord. The Lord is addressed as fire because he can burn anything into ashes, including the sins of the surrendered soul. As described in the previous mantra, the real or ultimate aspect of the absolute is, the, is his feature as a personality of Godhead and his impersonal Brahma Jyoti feature is a dazzling covering over his face. Fruitive activities are the karma kanda path of self-realization is the lowest state in this endeavor. As soon as such activities even slightly deviate from the regulated principles of the Vedas, they're transformed into vikarma or acts against the interest of the actor. Such v-karma is enacted by the illusion living entity simply for sense gratification. And thus such activities become hindrances on the path of self-realization. So, Prabhupada is explaining how the Lord can destroy unlimited amounts of sins, just like a fire consumes whatever you put in the fire, the fire will burn it to ashes. So the same way the Lord can remove the sins of all the living entities. But we have to approach him in his personal feature. So the, there, there is the impersonal feature and there is a personal feature. So those who, are, who 
worship the impersonal Brahman, they can be just simply absorbed in the dazzling oneness. And they never see the actual Lord. They never see the form of the Lord. We just become attracted by the gl glaring light. And on the other hand, you have people who want to simply enjoy the results of work. The interest is not so much self-realization, but they want they have some interest in self-realization, but it's in a, a low level. So their path is called the Karma Kanda path, path of fruit of activities. But the problem with the Karma Kanda path is if you make a little mistake, then you get v karma. You get sinful reactions. You get problems. You may want to. You may want to do charity. But if you if something goes wrong in the charity, then it can take you to hell. Just like in the Krishna book, it descri describes about Maharaj Nriga how he was giving charity and he, he gave the same cow by mistake, he gave the same cow away to two brahmanas and the two brahmanas were both thinking this cow belongs to me so they came to complain to the king and they the king could not satisfy them although the king was ready to give them both many more cows they would not take any more. They said, no, I, the, the, this cow was the one you gave to me. So like that, they, the two brahmanas, uh, they could not be pacified. And the king had to suffer for that. And similarly, we may also do things like that. The karma. We get react. So the path of karma kanda, it, it's uh, it has to be done. <laughs> it's not recommended, in other words. And the results, of course, of karma kanda are temporary. For example, by the path of karma kanda opens the doors to heaven. You can go to heaven, but how long? You can you stay in heaven? You cannot stay there forever have to come back again. So this is a problem with the Karmakanda path. The path of Karmakanda is a path of material enjoyment. But material enjoyment means it's temporary and limited. All right. Prabhupada's purport says, self-realization is possible in the human form of life, but not in other forms. There are 8,400,000 species of forms of life, of which the human form qualified by, Brahmin, by, Brahm, by Brahminical culture presents the only chance to obtain knowledge of transcendence. Brahminical culture includes truthfulness, sense control, forbearance, simplicity, full knowledge, and full faith in God. It is not that one simply becomes proud of his high parentage, just as being born the son of a big man affords one a chance to become a big man. So being born the son of a brahmana gives one a chance to become a brahmana. But such a, bless, such a birthright is not everything, for one still has to attain the brahminical qualifications for himself. 
as soon as one becomes proud of his birth as the son of a brahmana and neglects to acquire the qualifications of a real brahmana, he at once becomes degraded and falls from the path of self-realization. Thus his life's mission as a human being is defeated. <laughs> So life's mission as a human being, we should understand there is a mission in this human life. And it's not just simply make money and uh, live comfortably and die happily. Of course, that's, that's a joke. You think, oh, I will die peacefully. It's not quite like that. So human life has a mission. And the mission means we should try to develop the Brahminical qualities Miracle qualities means we'll be connected to the mode of goodness. And then Prabhupada talks about being a Brahmana. It's not just simply by birth. Although people often think that because they're, they're born in a Brahmana family, so they are Brahmana. And they don't have any of the qualities of the Brahmana. So one has to also acquire the qualities of the Brahmana. It's not enough just simply to take birth in the family of a Brahmana. So human life is an important thing. And we want to use it properly. And we do want to try to develop the Brahminical status. Come up to the Brahminical status and the mode of goodness, and then from the mode of goodness, then we can transcend. So Prabhupada talks about what is required to become a Brahmana. And he mentions these different points. Full faith in God, full knowledge, forbearance, simplicity, sense control. These things are practically forgotten about today but we need to we need to encourage people to develop the brahminical status so this is a prayer certainly at the time of death a devotee would like to have that brahminical status and then we can offer prayers to the lord so Prabhupada then continues in the Bhagavad Gita 6, 41 to 42, we are assured by the Lord that the yoga brastas or souls fallen from the path of self-realization are given a chance to rectify themselves by, by taking birth either in the families of good brahmanas or in the families of rich merchants. Such births afford higher chances for self-realization. If these chances are misused due to illusion, one loses the good opportunity of human life afforded by the Almighty Lord. So, Bhagavad Gita describes situation. One is a person who is advanced in yoga, but still not completely perfect. That they would take birth in the family of devotees. And someone else practices yoga for a short time, but not perfect. And they would take birth, they would go to the heavenly planets and satisfy their senses there because they still had the desire for sense gratification. So they would take birth in the higher planets and enjoy sense gratification there, then come back to earth and take birth in a family of rich merchants. And hopefully they would again take up Krishna consciousness, take up their spiritual path. 
so so persons born in that kind of family then it's easier for them to become self-realized all right the regulative principles are such that one who follows them is promoted from the platform of fruit of activities to the platform of transcendental knowledge. After many, many lifetimes of cultivating transcendental knowledge, one becomes perfect when he surrenders unto the Lord. This is the general procedure. But one who surrenders at the very beginning, as recommended in this mantra, at once surpasses all preliminary stages simply by adopting the devotional attitude. As stated in Bhagavad Gita 1866, the Lord at once takes charge of such a surrendered soul and frees him from all reactions to his sinful acts. There are many un there are many sinful reactions involved in karma kanda activities, whereas in jnana kanda, the path of philosophical development the chances of such sinful, sinful activities is smaller. But in devotional service to the Lord, the path of bhakti, there is practically no chance of incurring sinful reactions because a devotee of the Lord attains all the good qualities of the Lord himself. What to speak of those of a Brahmana? A devotee automatically attains the qualifications of, of an expert Brahmana authorized to perform sacrifices. Even though the devotee may not have taken his birth in a Brahmana family. Such is the omnipotency of the Lord. He can make a man born in a Brahmana family a degraded, as degraded as a low-born dog eater. And he can also make a low-born dog eater superior to a qualified brahmana simply on the strength of devotional service. <laughs> so, uh, Srila Prabhupada is describing how the Lord has that power that he can make anyone, bring anyone to the highest platform if they're devotees by devotional service. Even someone is of low birth, but they quickly become righteous and attain lasting peace. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, declare it boldly, my devotee will never perish. Mm -hmm. So, Even someone is born in the Brahmana family, it's not a qualification. Sometimes people, they're born in the Brahmana family, but they may be of the lowest qualities. They may be meat eaters, drunkards, intoxication, gambling. They can do so many things. And at the same time, they claim they're Brahmana. You can buy a Brahmana thread in the market. Anyone can put on the Brahmana thread. People think that is the Brahmana. You have the Brahmana thread. But the Brahmana thread 
is not the real sign of a brahmana. The qualities of the brahmana have to be there. And specifically, peacefulness, self-control, mercy, austerity. The four regulative principles which we follow. These are the very basic qualification of a brahmana. It doesn't matter if you've studied Bhakti Shastri or not. That's not important. What is important is how, what, what are you doing? We want to see the activities. Somebody may have taken the Bhakti Shastri exam and at the same time they're also meat eating. and So we don't like that. This, this course on Bhakti Shastri this is meant for people who are practicing spiritual life. The people who are serious about spiritual life want to improve their knowledge of the Shastra. And somebody's not following any regulative principles, they have no real right to understand the scriptures because they're not applying them. They don't follow anything. So what, what is the good for them to study the scripture? If they cannot follow basic principles, then they have no qualification. Prabhupada's purport continues, since the omnipotent Lord is situated within the heart of everyone, he can give directions to his sincere devotees by which they can attain the right path. Such directions are especially offered to the devotee, even if he desires something else. As far as others are concerned, God gives sanction to the doer only at the risk of the doer. But in the case of a devotee, the Lord directs him in such a, in such a way that he never acts wrongly. The Srimad Bhagavatam says, Swapada mulam bhajata priyasya taktanya bhavasya hare parayasha vikarmaya 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 totapati tam Tatanchit Dunoti Sarvan Redi Sani Vishta. The Lord is so kind to the devotee who is fully surrendered to his lotus feet that even, even though the devotee sometimes falls into, into the entanglement of karma into the entanglement of vikarma it acts against the Vedic directions to the Lord at once rectifies such mistakes from within his heart. This is because the devotees are very dear to the Lord. So here again we see the point how the Lord is merciful to the devotees. At the beginning of the purport, Prabhupada was describing how in bhakti yoga you don't get sinful reactions in performing bhakti yoga even you do something wrong, you're not going to get sinful reactions for it. The, the Lord appreciates that devote, someone's making an effort to be a devotee. So, in Karmakanda, you do something wrong, you get reactions. 
And jnana kanda, less possibility of getting simple reaction. But in bhakti yoga, there's no reactions to bhakti yoga. Of course, we have to do the bhakti yoga properly. We can't think, oh, okay, then I can eat meat, or oh, then I can do some sinful activity, and I won't suffer. No, of course not. We cannot do like that. To commit sinful activities in the strength of chanting, it's a great offense. So we have to understand the, the meanings here. That the Lord is very kind to the devotee. But it's mentioned here, the Lord is kind to the devotee. To what? To which devotee? To the devotee who is fully surrendered to his lotus feet. So this is a problem, you see. It's not just any devotee, but those who are surrendered to the lotus feet of the Lord. So the devotee sometimes may fall down and sometimes may get some big, some karmic reaction. But the Lord, the Lord will uh, rectify the mistakes from within his heart. The Lord has that relationship with his devotee. He wants to help his devotee. And he arranges for the purification of the heart of his devotee. But not just any devotee. We have to be fully surrendered to his lotus feet. That's it. The chant is not just for any devotee. All right, in this mantra of Sri Ishopanishad, the devotee prays to the Lord to rectify him from within his heart. To err is human. A conditioned soul is very often apt to commit mistakes. And the only remedial measure to take against such unintentional sins is to give oneself up to the lotus feet of the Lord so that he may guide one to avoid such pitfalls. The Lord takes charge of fully surrendered souls. Thus, all problems are solved simply by surrendering oneself unto the Lord and acting in terms of his directions. Such directions are given to the sincere devotee in two ways. One is by way of the saints, scriptures, and spiritual master. And the other is by way of the Lord himself, who resides within the heart of everyone. Thus a devotee, fully enlightened with Vedic knowledge, is protected in all respects. All right, so Prabhupada is telling us the two ways in which the Lord arranges to help and to guide the devotee. First of all, there's Sadhu, Shastra, and Guru, the three authorities. Sadhu, Shastra, and Guru, they are important spiritual authorities. Everyone needs, we need to be guided by Sadhu, Shastra, and Guru. And there should be no contradiction between sadhu, shastra, and guru. And then, and the, the other thing, the other method is that the Lord from the heart, the Paramatma is also sometimes called the Chaitya Guru, the super soul in the heart, Chaitya Guru. 
So he's got directing us. Uh, so we have to, we, we can't, we have no re real excuse. If the Lord is speaking to us from the heart, we have to hear him. The Lord is speaking to us. Sometimes we don't hear him speaking. Just like there's a pastime said there was this one man, one man, he, he had a conversation with the Lord and he told the Lord that I will go with you, but you have to tell me, you have to tell me before, you have to give me warning before you take me. You know, when before I leave this world, you have to let me know that my time's over. So it happened after some time, then the man died. And so the man, the man was protesting. He said, you know, you didn't warn me. You didn't warn me. But the Lord said to him, no, he said, look, I warned you. Look, your hair is all fallen out and gray. Your skin is all wrinkled. I th This was my warning to you. You should have seen the, these warnings are there for you. So we have to understand how the Lord is speaking to us in these different ways through the material nature. How the body ages and gets diseased and breaks down. And similarly, that this is an indication, this is a warning from the Lord that this body is temporary and we have to prepare. We have to become very serious. So Krishna is speaking to all of us, but we have to hear him. And Sadhu, Shastra and Guru are also there. All right, then Prabhupada continues, Vedic knowledge is transcendental and cannot be understood by mundane educational procedures. One can understand the Vedic mantras only by the grace of the Lord and the spiritual master. Yasya Devi para bhakti yata Devi tata guru. If one takes shelter of a bona fide spiritual master, it is to be understood that he has obtained the grace of the Lord. The Lord appears as a spiritual master for the devotee. Thus, the spiritual master, the Vedic injunctions, and the Lord himself, From within, all guide the devotee in the full strength. In this way, there is no chance for a devotee to fall again into the maya of material illusion. The devotee thus, pro thus protected, the devotee thus protected all around is sure to reach the ultimate destination of perfection. The entire process of the entire process is hinted in this mantra and Srimad Bhagavatam one two seventeen to twenty explains it further. All right, so Prabhupada is referring to the importance hearing from the guru. You have to have a spiritual master. You have to have faith in the spiritual teacher. Yasya Devi, Yasya Devi Parabhaktir, Yata Devi, Tata Guru. 
you should have faith, equal faith in both the Lord and in the Guru. When we have equal faith in the Lord and in the Guru, then all the purports of the scriptures are revealed very easily. So that's the point. Uh, the Lord from within guides the devotee. We, uh, the, we, we should feel the presence of the Lord in our heart. How he's guiding us, how he's arranging for us, makes arrangements for our spiritual welfare, for our progress. And we should be taking shelter of the words of the Guru also and their instructions. So in this way, a devotee is protected from all, is protected from all inauspiciousness and is able to reach the ultimate perfection. And then Prabhupada refers to Srimad Bhagavatam, which explains it further. And that's the next paragraph. Prabhupada is going on to explain these verses of Srimad Bhagavatam. So he says, hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord is in itself an act of piety. The Lord wants everyone to hear and chant his glories because he is the well wisher, the well wisher of all living entities. By hearing, and chanting the glories of the Lord, one becomes cleansed of all undesirable things. And then one's devotion becomes fixed upon the Lord. At this stage, the devotee acquires the Brahminical qualifications and the effects of the lower modes of nature, passion and ignorance completely vanish. The devotee becomes fully enlightened by virtue of his devotional service. And thus he comes to know the path of the Lord and the way to attain him. As all doubts diminish, he becomes a pure devotee. So Srila Prabhupada is paraphrasing these verses from the Srimad Bhagavatam, describing how hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam, hearing scriptures, hearing about the glories of the Lord is a pious activity. Srimvatam Svakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana. Ridhyanta stohiya badrani vidu notis suritsatam. By hearing, then we cleanse the heart. And when we cleanse the heart, then we get rid of the dirty things from the heart and we're able to focus on the Lord. And as we focus on the Lord, then of course, then naturally, that we'll get free from the effects of passion and ignorance. Again, the point is made, you have, we have to come up to the mode of goodness. We don't want to be influenced by passion and ignorance. Come up to the mode of goodness, then from the mode of goodness, then we can go on to devotional service. And we can come to know the Lord and how we can attain him. So thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport of Sri Shopanishad, the knowledge that brings one nearer to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. Right? Prabhupada gave that title, subtitle to the Ishopanishad. The knowledge that brings one nearer to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. All right, are there any questions? 
Any questions at all on anything? Maharaj. Yes. Um, Maharaj, what if one remembers a pure devotee at the end of his life, at the point of death? Well, if you remember the pure devotee, then that's very good. And you go, you go there to be with the pure devotee. If the, if he's a pure devotee, then he's always thinking of Krishna. And if you remember the pure devotee, then you will also go to be with Krishna. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. Uh, Maharaj, uh, Lord Krishna talks about uh, four different varnas or nature that people have. So in this verse, uh, there is a lot of explanation of the Brahminical qualities, but also Krishna explained uh, good qualities also that uh, other classes or other varnas should have you no know, good qualities for Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Sudras. So if somebody belong to another varna which is not a, a brahmana a, how they have the chance a, to a, you know a, progress on on those brahminical qualities which are being described and being able to go to the mood of goodness and practice devotional service <laughs> a, a, means those persons belong to a different other other varnas, they should aspire for their own qualities. Are they described uh, in the Bhagavad Gita by Lord Krishna? If you please can clarify something on this, we'll appreciate. Yes. Well, we have to understand that even though one may be working as a Vaishya or a Sudra or Kshatriya, whatever, but still we can have the Brahm Brahminical qualities. He can be freed from passion and ignorance if he is cultivating devotional service. Because the nature of devotional service is such that it purifies everyone who engages in devotional service. So even one is working as a Vaisha doesn't <laughs> doesn't mean that he has to have the the, the lower qualities. You know, he can cultivate the good qualities. You know, we shouldn't think, oh, well, because I'm a sudra, I'm allowed to eat meat. Or because I'm a sudra, I'm allowed to do all sinful activities. No, we may work as a sudra, we may be doing sudra work, but we can also, we can have the qualities of the brahmana. And we see we have many devotees like that. They're working in jobs maybe working in multinational corporations and so on, working for big companies and, you know, they've got position. But they're very Brahminical. They're very clean. They're, and they, they're, they're, uh, pra they're, they're uh, peaceful. They're auste they can practice some austerity, you know. And they have faith in God. They have faith. They worship they will chant the holy name. They're chanting every day. They're worshipping the Lord. So it's not a, a fact that just because one is a Vaisha, a Sudra, or a Kshatriya, that you cannot have the Brahminical qualities. But anyone who's engaged in devotional service, then um, they transcend the modes of nature. So it's the power of devotional service that it brings one out from the material nature and bring bring one out from the material nature means you come up to the mode of goodness. Right. Hey, thank you, Maharaj. So, yeah, we want to come up to pure goodness, of course. The idea is to come up, even to get go beyond the mode of goodness and come up to the level of pure goodness. But 
you know, first we have to come to the mode of goodness. Before you can get to pure goodness, first you have to come up to goodness. And then we can go on. So we have to cultivate the proper qualities. And the qualities are there. that mentioned, you know, to, what do you need to do to be a brahmana? It, it doesn't mean you have to just do the work of the brahmana. Although that is also very nice. You want to be a brahmana, you to do the work of a brahmana. But you're not able to do the work of a brahmana. But in your heart, you can be doing the work of a brahmana. You can have a deity, just like many people. They have jobs. So you could say they're sudras. But they're also worshipping a deity. They have deities in their home. They have regular kirtan and they practice self-control, practice regulated principles. So they're, they're also Brahmins, in a sense. They may be engaged in all kinds of other work, but that is temporary. By nature, they are devotees. The devotional service is what makes a difference because they're engaged in devotional service. So they're free from the material energy. Somebody's not engaged in devotional service, then their karmis, they're, they're under the law, karma kanda, they're under the laws, material nature. But a devotee, is transcendentally situated. So, so to come to that transcendental position, we have to come up to the mode of goodness. And to come up to the mode of goodness, there are certain qualities which we have to acquire. All right? And we have to be some, there has to be peaceful, uh, uh, peacefulness, self control austerity, samo damasta pasocham, peacefulness, self-control, purity, austerity. So these qualities are important. What makes it a real sign of a devotee is that not only that he has these qualities, but he also chants a holy name, of course. Lord Chaitanya was concerned like that, that somebody, how to recognize a devotee? Well, they have to chant the holy name. Then you know he's a real devotee. So people may be pious and may be practicing the four principles, but they don't chant. Then it's important then sometimes they will definitely be influenced to worldliness. They'll spend their time just simply making money and spending money to maintain the home. Like that, you just pass that time uselessly. So we want to understand how to make proper use of the human life. And it's required to develop the better qualities. To somebody who is born in a Brahmana family, Prabhupada explains, it's an advantage to them, but it's not everything. They still have to develop the good qualities. It's not just simply only the birth. So we have to understand that the meaning there, the value of Brahminical birth certainly good. We respect the Brahmanas. All right. They're born in, it's a good birth. But take advantage. Become a Brahmana. Develop the qualities of the Brahmana. Nowadays, not many people work as a Brahmana. But still, uh, there are some great souls who like to work as the Brahmana, simply teach this teach the Shastras and study the Shastra and 
worship the deity and teach others to worship the deity and give charity and accept charity. So that's what Brahman is supposed to do. Of course, it's difficult for people these days in this age to, to live like that. But that is the standard of Brahminical culture. But we are not just practicing Varnashram. We are practicing devotional service. And devotional service is transcendental to, to these things. Right? You understand, Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj, very well, Maharaj. Brilliant your explanation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, uh, question? Hare, Hare Krishna, Maharaj, I have a question. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, uh, uh, now, Maharaj, uh, now that uh, we are going to end uh, our class and we are going to finish our union and all, this question has been running uh, on my head for quite some time already. I hope you can assist me, Maharaj. Like uh, some of us, we are doing Bhakti Shastri so that we are able to take a uh, Brahmin initiation. And uh, some of us, we are married with kids and uh, also commitments. So, uh, taking Brahmana initiation, there are certain things that, uh, like me, I personally think that by taking Brahmana initiation, we have to omit uh, certain things which uh, uh, can, uh, which, which is, uh, which is, uh, which might be of uh, offending to a certain kind of things. So, Maharaj, in this kind of uh, situation, for example, with us being committed with kids and as grastas. And some hours, our spouse might not even take initiation or anything like that. Now, Maharaj, how can we cater to their needs at the same time, uh, not offending them, Maharaj? Like at times, they have, uh, like the kids, for example, they have to go out and they say they want to eat this and that, for instance. And as a Brahmana, I know that I can't do that and I can't, uh, I can't like uh, listen to whatever they have to say. But they would not be in a situation where they won't be understanding towards us. So in this kind of situation, Maharaj, what can we do? It is not only eating out, Maharaj, there are a few other things also involved. So how do I face this kind of things, Maharaj? Well, yes, it's a challenge. Uh... In that kind of situation, of course, you have to understand we all have our own karma because you come to Krishna consciousness after marriage like that. So then it, it, it becomes a problem. And if you come to, into Krishna consciousness and your husband doesn't come into Krishna consciousness and then the children, they're, they're not brought up to appreciate the importance of vegetarian diet and you know they're accustomed to maybe eat other things so it's a problem but you have to have faith that somehow by your karma Krishna has given you the chance to come to Krishna consciousness. And you should be grateful for that. That you at least you can be in Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. And if your children can be taught also the importance and the value of vegetarian food, being a vegetarian, being a devotee, then that's also very nice. The more you can get the, the children and your husband to have an appreciation for Krishna consciousness, then, then that will make the difference. So Thank you. You, you want to go for second initiation? Well, yes, your second initiation would complete the initiation. And uh, you want to understand second initiation as further commitments. 
you have to chant another 210 mantras every day, you know. And second initiation is means you want to do more service. So, you know, it, it's uh, it's not just simply chant the Gayatri, but, you know, it means second initiated devotee means that you want to take more responsibility. You have to chant, you have to maybe give classes sometimes, we have to be willing to do service more. So there is responsibilities involved with the second initiation. So one should be serious, one should be committed that one wants to take up that service and one is willing to do that extra service for the Lord. Right? Sometimes people just want, want the status of being a Brahman. But the status is not the point. You see, it's, it's not so much that you're a Brahman, but what, what's required is that the devotee actually, uh, the devotee actually wants to have the qualities of the Brahmana. The qualities of the Brahmana are very important. So, recognize your situation and at the same time be happy that Krishna has given you, given you the chance to come to Krishna consciousness. And maybe your husband or your family, children like that, maybe they don't have the same appreciation as you. But okay, you know, be tolerant. You know, don't be condemning. Don't be criticizing them and pointing, complaining. Just accept that, oh, this is how they are. And I haven't been able to convince them. I haven't been able to change them. Sometimes you just have to accept these things. But just be happy somehow that you can be Krishna conscious. Yeah? Yeah, it's I a common, so. it's a I common think. situation. You know, you're not unique. There's many other people in that sim similar situation, and you just have to be grateful for the fact that you can be Krishna conscious. Mm hmm. Yeah, is that all right, Maharaji? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Very well understood, Maharaj. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes? Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Um, from all, uh, um, Vyasadev wrote all this mantra. Uh, did he also write the purport? Um, I was uh, thinking uh, this... Uh, uh, this by just reading, there is no mention of Krishna in all these mantras. So, did he write for people who are not uh, convinced uh, that Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead for them? Uh, as uh, Prabhupada also tells that knowledge that brings one nearer to the supreme personality of Godhead. Yes, well, of course, the, the purports are written by Srila Prabhupada. But the rest, the mantras, they're written by, well, they're from the Vedas. It said Swayambhava Manu speaking. Okay. okay. And uh, no mention of Krishna. Yes, because it's the Vedas. You see, from the Vedas, then you, you don't get knowledge of Krishna so easily. That it's very difficult to understand Krishna from the Vedas. But it's very easy to know Krishna from a devotee. So the Vedic knowledge is like that. That if you simply go to the Vedas, then there's a lot of covered meanings. 
and the the original meaning, the pure, uh, the higher meaning is often not so visible. So trying to understand Krishna from the Vedas, Lord Brahma says in the Brahma Samhita, he said, very difficult to know Krishna from the Vedas. That I mentioned before in the beginning that how the Vedic knowledge is like that, but that you don't get a lot of information. You don't. There's no mention of Krishna there. But we're told the Lord, and we know he has a form. So the indication is there that there is a person. It's not just simply impersonal energy, but there is a person there. And we offer prayers. We don't offer prayers to, to, to the impersonal, to the energy, to the light. We offer prayers to the person. So we we have to understand that how the 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 devotee is praying to the Lord. And Prabhupada is elaborating in the purports about the reciprocation which the Lord gives to the devotee. That those who approach the Lord with devotion, then the Lord helps them to come to them, to come to him, and he takes away any of their uh, defects or deficiencies in order to help them to come to him. So like this, you just want to understand the Lord. Yeah, we can. Uh, there, there are the, the secondary names of the Lord. Just like secondary names of the Lord mean names like Jagannath, the Lord of the Universe, or Ishwara, or uh, names like uh, Allah. Paramatma, <laughs> right? Paramatma, yeah. Mm -hmm. there, there are different secondary names of the Lord. The, the, they're, they're describing simply some, some aspect of the Lord. But you have to understand that there's a person. It's not just simply impersonal light, not just simply some energy. But there's a person who has a form, and he has a name also. But the Vedas are preparing us to come to Krishna. Right? So it's bringing us, as Prabhupada said, knowledge on the path to brings us nearer to the personality of Godhead, Krishna. So Prabhupada wrote the Ishopanishad. He wrote that while he was still in India. He had not gone to America at this time. And he had written his purports on the Sri Ishopanishad. Later on, when he went to America, then he told the devotees how he had written it. And so then they got the, the copy, they got the manuscript, and they were able to print the book. But Prabhupada had written it even before he'd gone to America. So his preaching there was mainly for, you know, the Indian people, the Indian culture. So he's talking about some of the different bogus theories which come up, like, you know, many paths all lead to the one God, some of these, these kind of things, and Worship of man is worship of God. And so Prabhupada was preaching against these kind of things. From time to time, somebody will come up with some nonsense, some nonsense philosophy. So Prabhupada could def would defeat these different arguments and bring people back to the real path, which is to follow sadhu, shastra, and guru. But often people don't like to hear from Sadhu, Shastra, and Guru. And they don't like to hear from the Lord in the heart. They will hear from their own mind. That's the problem. 
people want to hear from their own mind. They don't hear properly. Okay. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Yes, any other question? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna Dandabak pranams. Uh, Maharaj, I have one doubt. Like, I have a doubt. I just wanted to know, like, uh, sometimes there are conflict of, uh, like, I, if I wanted to do some service, for example, like uh, book distribution going on. So if, uh, if uh, at the same time there is a lecture or uh, association of some pure devotee, some uh, some pure devotee is like uh, uh, we have an Harina. So I mean, uh, sometimes there is conflict of. Uh, uh, I mean, services between in our mind, like, or maybe our chanting is not completed, and at the same time, book distribution service we need to go. So I mean, how to prioritize? Or sometimes there is uh, there is that uh, some material responsibilities we have to fulfill. I mean, how to prioritize which which things to be given more importance? <laughs> Yes, I know it's difficult, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> anyway, everything according to the time and the place and the circumstances. You have to consider these factors also. The time, you know, what is the time? What is, is it at the proper time? <laughs> and the place. What are they asking you to do? Is it proper? So we, we try. We try to serve. Give Our mood is to give service. But at the same time, we have to understand also that you may have other responsibilities. Just like as a woman, maybe you have a family. So you have some commitments to your family also. You cannot neglect your family duties just to simply go and uh, do some service at the temple. You have to be realistic and you have to uh, keep the, the, the situation peaceful. You don't want to be having your husband complain all the time. Right? So you have to remember that you have to please your husband. Husband is also the guru, guru patni. So you have to serve him. At the same time, you want to serve Krishna. So, yes. You have to consider what is required. How urgent is this service? And how important is it that you do it? Is it? Are you the only one who can do it? Or are there other people there also to do it? You may like to do it. You like to do service. So sometimes people may take advantage of you. That, oh, yeah, this girl, she always comes. If I tell her to come, she will come. But you have to consider your own situation. What are your other responsibilities? What are your other commitments? And then you have to do what is necessary. You have to consider what is necessary. I sometimes find it a very difficult question. Look, if, if suppose I have one hour and like that time uh, I can take either association of some pure devotee or that one hour I can use for like doing some service like for book distribution. So which one is more important? Well, it's all important. You can't say one is more important than the other. It's all important, you know, book distribution is important. And what what was the other thing you were saying? Book distribution. Some, some pure devotees are uh, coming in the temple. I'm saying the association of some uh, senior devotee, some pure devotees coming in our temple. So maybe that Harinam and organized. 
Yes, well, you do want to take advantage of these things. If you can, some senior devotees coming, you do want to go and try to hear from them, take advantage of their association. That's nice. At the same time, book distribution is also important. It's a question, it's really up to you. Where is your taste, you know? What do you like to do? You know? And, and of course, the, the, temple, the temple may feel that they would like you to be at the temple to hear from the guests, to hear from the advanced devotees who are coming there to speak to you. So you should take advantage of their association to hear from them. Because you can go on book distribution every day without any restriction. You can go anytime and distribute books. But you don't get the opportunity to associate with senior Vaishnavas anytime. It's rare when the senior Vaishnava comes. So we should try to take advantage to go and hear from them. And the, temp the temple authorities may encourage you to come and hear rather than to go out on book distribution. Thank Understood. You so yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. Very good questions. Any other question tonight? Okay. If there are no more questions, then we will finish the class here. When is your exam? 29th December, my lord. 29th December. Okay, so you've next, got... A... Next Friday. Okay, so you've got more than a week to prepare. We hope you don't forget everything in the course of a week. <laughs> anyway... Very nice to have your association and to go through the Ishopanishad with all of you. And we wish you all success in your Bhakti Shastri. And we hope you can all complete the course. Certainly you've come a long way if you're already up to Ishopanishad. Is this the last unit? One more unit is left. Which one? Uh, and nectar of devotion. Oh, nectar of devotion. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's quite a long, a long chapter, a long, bigger unit. All right. So anyway, thank you all very much, and we hope you all do well in your final exam. Get this unit behind you and go on to Nectar of Devotion and complete the Bhakti Shastri. There will be a great credit to Srila Prabhupada. So many of you have studied carefully Srila Prabhupada's books. Okay? So thank you all very much for your association. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, so much. Thank you, Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you for thank, thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Happy senses, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj.